Hey everybody, um, Sunday night, so I'm doing another video here. Um, this one I wrote a few years back, uh, November 14th, 2017, and I titled it Alcohol and the Christian. And so I've kind of been wrestling with this in my mind here all week, um, thinking about doing this article. And um, even when I wrote it, uh, I was I was hesitant, and um, I wrote that into the article, which I'll get to. But um, there's been more internal wrestling and hesitancy as I approach this video. And um, the reason being is that um, I tend to be, I don't know what the word is, I guess kind of bold in 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 my positions you know if if I, I but and i think that stems from you know i believe in the absolute authority of the word of god um even in areas where i fail even in areas where i'm a hypocrite in it um if i see it in the scriptures it is the truth and and so if my lifestyle is in opposition to that that is sin and i need to change my lifestyle um but i, I still won't hesitate to speak it and, and I'll speak that truth, um, knowing that I need to submit myself to it, um, as well as others. Um, but a lot of times that boldness um, seems to offend people. People like to live in, in gray areas, um, where they say, you know, we're not really sure um, absolutely one way or another what, what, the, what the truth is on this, on this particular topic. So um, we'll let bygones be bygones. And... Um, I can't, I, I have a real hard time doing that. Um, I, I don't believe in gray areas. I believe um, I'm a very black and white guy. And like I said, it's because I believe in the authority of the word. If God says it, it is true. Um, there is no if, ands, or buts. There is no maneuvering around that. There is no twisting around that. It is a truth. Even in, in, in you know, especially, I guess, not especially, but even if it's in opposition to my life, um, it is a truth. And, 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 and so I must bring myself into submission to that truth. Jesus said, if we love him, we'll obey him. You know, we'll keep his word. We'll cherish his word. We'll love his word. And, and, and his word is authoritative. It's absolute. And so what he says is, is truth. And um, sometimes, though, um, there are issues that it's hard to pinpoint what the truth is. Um and, and, and so I guess um, that's how I wanted to preface this. Um, and, and the idea is based on Romans 14. So I'm going to read that. Um, it says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. 
I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat, afore whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. Uh, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou, ha hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So Romans 14 outlines that... Um, where each behold each born again Christian is beholden to their own conscience, to the own their own the own work of the Holy Spirit within that individual. And, and there are certain areas um, that are kind of gray areas. Here it mentions eating meats offered to idols or or celebrating certain holy days. Um and and you could liken that today to like if somebody wants to you know stick to the old Sabbath. Um, Friday at sundown till Saturday at sundown and they esteem that Sabbath day higher than others while somebody else says Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath and every day is a Sabbath in the Lord um, in each case um, that person is glorifying the Lord in their heart um, by holding that one day or all days alike the same and so it's it's a gray area where we don't have and and so this is this is what I think on this topic here um, if, if a thing is not specifically identified as sin in Scripture, if, you, if we can't point to a specific Scripture that says, uh, Thou shalt not do this, or a Scripture that says, Thou shalt do this, specific commands or specific um, forbidding, um, then we enter this generality of, of righteousness and... Um, obeying your own conscience and, and, and walking in the Spirit and obeying the Lord and not judging one another in the things that we may have freedom in. So I'm going to talk about alcohol, and just to put it out there right away, I do believe alcohol is a sin. Um, there, there is a gray area there. Is it drunkenness that is a sin, or is it alcohol in itself? And, and we're going to get into that in my article here, but... Um, a lot of people that will then who defend the position of having a drink now and then um, will bring up issues like tobacco use or caffeine use or watching television um, or things of that nature, other things. And 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 the idea there is there's no specific scripture that you can take um, a brother who might smoke cigarettes or smoke an e-cig and and say, look here, the scripture says you shall not do this. A lot of times we can find uh, general principles, you know, like, like somebody will point out the body is the holy temple and we're not to defile the holy temple. Well, again, that, that's, a, that's a not a very specific thing because then uh, an argument could be made that uh, caffeine, you know, might defile the temple or fatty meats or sugar uh, might defile the temple or the chemicals in a soda pop. Um, or even the chemicals in, in tap water nowadays with the fluoride in it, uh, like the shirt I'm wearing. Uh, there's poison in the water. Um, but, so there are the, these gray areas, I think, where, where you know, if a, if a brother or sister likes to drink coffee, um, but to another brother or sister, that, that's a sinful thing. You know, a, a caffeine, they might say, well, that's a mood-altering substance it's a drug you shouldn't be using it somebody might go as far as saying even like ibuprofen or aspirin or something along those lines and so you enter this area uh, of generality where where if and i think that's where romans 14 might come into play is uh if a brother or sister thinks that using caffeine is a sin 
they'll they'll refrain from using it as a glory to God because it would violate their conscience and they want to glorify God in that. But if another brother or sister says, I don't see any specific scripture um, that would forbid me from using caffeine and so I'm going to enjoy it as a gift from God and 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 praise the Lord in it, I think I think that's where the Romans 14 would come into play because we can't definitively um, find scriptures that specifically say whether or not this is a sin. Um, you know, it, the same with television watching. Television watching is not beneficial. There, there's so much idolatry and 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 cussing and swearing and 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 nudity and and lust and 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 all these things that that shouldn't be done. Um, can we judge another brother or sister though uh, for watching a television show? Can we say, you know, that sin? I need to separate from you. Um, I don't think we have specific verses. We can certainly caution them and say, you know, is this really beneficial for you? Um, is this really edifying? Um, but I don't think we, we, we can divide over that and say, look, th this is a grievous sin. And I, I got to, I'm sorry, brother, but I got to separate from it, you know. I don't think we can do that, you know. And, and again, uh, somebody might bring up verses like, you know, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes in the Psalms. But then a counterpoint can be made to that and say, well, you know, that, that's a vow that the psalmist made to him to himself and to God. That's not a commandment um, that's put to us, although there is scripture that says, I will avoid all appearances of evil. Um, so there's there really are the, these areas where we kind of have to wrestle it out um, within ourselves, with it, within our own conscience, um, on whether or not this is beneficial. And, and, and we need to be sincere and honest with ourselves. Are we looking for loopholes? To please the flesh are we looking for for you know these little gray areas where i can get away with doing something that pleases my flesh um or am i truly seeking holiness am i truly seeking righteousness um but in either case um romans 14 tells us that we have to give um room for our brothers and sisters to work through these issues on their own they they serve their own master we all we all will give an account of ourselves to god every born again child so so if a brother or sister struggles with an e-cig or, or smokes a cigarette or or watches tv or drinks uh, you know coffee on a regular basis or likes to worship on a saturday um i i can't hold that against them i can't despise they're doing it for the glory of god and and so i can appreciate that that in them and if i have the liberty within myself if i've wrestled it out and said well you know the lord is fine with me worshiping on whatever day of the week i want to worship on um I, I can't look down my nose upon them for esteeming that sabbath day higher than all the other days i have to love that brother and understand that he's worshiping god as the holy spirit leads him and and Again, if we can't come now, the distinction would be is if we can have very specific verses that that command us to abstain or to do something. You know, the scriptures are very clear to flee fornication, um, to not lust, and 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 so those are are very specific. So a brother does not have liberty in those things. If a brother or sister is is wrapped up in those things, it's our job to come alongside them and say, "Look, uh, this is a sin. You know, uh, you got to flee from that. You got to you got to fight against this. You know, and and." Uh, there's no justification for these things, uh, but these other areas uh, uh, of like caffeine use and 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 you know the tobacco use or uh, television watching or Sabbath keeping, um, there these are these gray areas where we each have to serve God as we know how, and not judge one another and and not hate one another in it. Um, now, with all that said, um, I, I do think that alcohol is different, and I'm going to try to prove that. Um, as I'm saying this, though, I'm, I'm still wrestling out my own heart, and I, I wouldn't separate from a brother, brother or sister who has a beer now and then or a glass of wine. Um, I would be grieved by it because of my own personal convictions, and maybe that means I'm weak in the faith. Maybe that means it's a stumbling block uh, for me. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to be around um, while a brother or sister is doing it, I, I might ask them, I might say, you know, hey, th this is sin to me. Could could you not do it? You know, but I don't think I would separate from a brother. Uh, if they're uh, act if they're getting drunk, then, uh, then of course, there are specific verses we can point to. Um, 
besides Roman four, four, Romans 14, there, there's two additional um, verses that I, I, I want to consider. When, when we're trying to consider all these things, when we're trying to wrestle all these things out in our heart, um, two other principles that we want to keep in mind is that um, we don't want to be a stumbling block to another brother or sister. Um, if, if we know that this brother or sister thinks the things that we do are sinful... Um, if, if you have a brother or sister who, who smokes an e-cig or, um, um, some Christians are opposed, uh, to Christian rap or to Christian metal, they think there's something demonic about it. Um, so if, if you believe you have the liberty in that, if you've wrestled this out with the Lord and you think the Lord has given, you know, Christian metal or rap to you as a gift and, and that you can worship the Lord in it, or that you have liberty in 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 your uh, tobacco use or or e cig use or um, whatever the case, um, we have to be careful to not be a stumbling block. If you know that it's a, an offense to your brother or sister, you know that it's a sin to them. Um, then Rome or First Corinthians eight uh, tells us. Um, let's see here. Where's the verse? Well, it's talking about uh, the same principle that, that Romans 14 was talking about, eating meats that are offered to idols. And he's saying, you know, we, we know that idols aren't nothing. They're, they're fake. They're made up. You know, everything belongs to God, so I can eat whatever meat I want. Um, but it says here in verse 8, But meat commendeth us not, not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block, to them that are weak. So that's a principle that you want to keep in mind. You don't want to be a stumbling block to your brother or sister. You don't want to cause them um, to, to fall into sin or or to um, bring some sort of bitterness or, or, or contention between between you. Um, so you want to be cautious about that. And then the other thing I want, I want to consider is Romans 2. Um, which talks about, um, you know, preaching to people that they should do this or not do that. Um, it says in verse 24, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Um, so th the idea there is that um, sometimes the lost world will look at us and, and see these things as hypocrisy. They'll see them as sinful, and they'll use that as an occasion to blasphemy the name of the Lord. They'll use that as an occasion to disregard Christianity. So in our liberty, um, whatever we have liberty in, we want to keep those two principles in mind. One, I don't want to be a stumbling block to my sister or my brothers or sisters. And two, I don't want to offend the name of Christ in the Gentile world. I don't want to give lost people a reason um, to call me a hypocrite and dismiss what I say. Um, so the hip, you know, the lost world might see a brother or sister smoking a cigarette and say, oh, you call yourself a Christian, but you smoke? You know, so they'll see that as a sinful behavior and it'll give them a reason um, to disregard us, to disregard the message of Christ. So we want to avoid that. Um, with all that said, um, I'm going to get into this article on alcohol and, and why I think Christians uh, should not drink alcohol at all. Not not just get drunk. I think it should be avoided altogether. And I'm going to try to prove that through the scriptures. And um, as always, if you can't watch this live, um, subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can catch it at your convenience. Uh, it's King Ram 417 That's K, my middle initial, Ingram, my last name, 417. Um, I'll try to get this posted on uh, when, right away when I'm done with this live video. Uh, but you can watch that and all my videos at your convenience. And then uh, before getting into this article here, I'm just going to pray. Uh, so if you guys want to pray with me, that'd, that'd be great. Lord, how should I pray? I, I prayed um, 
forgiveness of my sins, Lord, even though there, there's hardness of heart in me and that I don't truly sorrow over my sins like I should. I'm not broken over my sins like I should be, Lord. There's there's a hypocrisy in me. There's There's insincerity in me. There's coldness in me, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you work in spite of my heart, that, that you move upon me, Lord, and you break my heart for my sins, that you, you grant me godly sorrow, Lord, and um, help me to hate my sin, Lord, to give no room for the flesh, to not, to not be pleased by the flesh, to, to not be led astray, Lord, and led off the path of righteousness, Lord, how quickly... We can fall into temptation and sin. And it's not worth it, Lord. I want to walk in holiness and righteousness. And Lord, I pray that you make me either hot or cold for you. I don't want to be lukewarm, Lord. I don't, I don't want to sit in the middle ground. I don't want to have one foot in the world and one foot in your kingdom, Lord. Uh, I just, I pray for your Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray for your work. I pray for your power, Lord. And Lord, with this article here, I pray that you grant me great humility and teachability, Lord. I recognize that there is a great possibility that I could be wrong on this. I recognize the hypocrisy in my heart that, that might exist if I'm wrong on this because there are things that I do that I, I, I feel I have liberty in. And, and so if I'm judging my brothers in, in this Romans 14 area, Lord, I pray that you grant me the eyes to see, Lord, that you grant me a, a heart of understanding. Help me to see my error, Lord. If, 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 if you have truly made it okay for a brother or sister to have a glass of wine every now and then and do it to your glory, Lord, help me to, to stop judging them in my heart and, and and just help me to see the error, Lord. Help me to see it, Lord. I, I Help me to understand. I, I don't want to be a hypocrite, Lord. I think about the things I do that others may look upon as, as sinful or not beneficial, Lord, and, and the things that I believe that you've given me freedom to do, Lord, and and that um, I'm, I'm able to rejoice and glorify you in it, Lord, and praise you for it. And if I'm missing that with this, Lord, I pray that you give me the eyes to see. And I, just, I pray that um, I not lead anybody astray, Lord. Forgive me for being a stumbling block um, to my brothers or sisters or being an offense um, to brothers or sisters. I pray that this 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 article and this video just be a, a chance to work through this issue, Lord, to um, to express what I, I think I see intellectually in your word, Lord, but I, I'm not sure if it's revealed to my heart, Lord. I, I pray that your truth be revealed to my heart, Lord, that I, that I would see what is true on this issue and that um, I, I would not dismiss or judge a brother or sister unjustly, Lord, and just, I pray for great humility and teachability, Lord. I pray for wisdom in, in both me and anybody listening, Lord. I pray that we, that we search the scriptures diligently, that we set aside our desires and what we want to be true, and that instead we just look to your word and submit to your word, Lord. If we can see the truth in your word, Lord, that we'll submit to it. And I pray that you would show us the truth on this issue. I just I pray for your mercy, Lord, and your grace, Lord. Humble my heart, Lord, and um, I thank you that in spite of my failures, even my recent failures and sins, Lord, um, that you still allow me, Lord, to come on here, and I, I pray that, that you uh, just grant me seriousness and sobriety of mind, Lord, because this is a a heavy issue to to take it upon oneself to teach or to proclaim your word, Lord, and we will face the greater uh, judgment, greater greater condemnation. And you said not to be many masters, Lord, and, and so I just pray for great fear and humility, Lord.
please help me in this topic, Lord, and, and bless the ears of anybody listening, Lord. Help us, help us to just do this for your glory, Lord, not, not as an argument, not as a divisive thing, but to, to learn the truth about what you would have us to know about this issue and all issues, Lord. We, we want to know the truth. We want to come to you and, and, and worship you in spirit and truth. We want to know you as you are, Lord. We want to know all your commandments. We want to worship you and love you and draw near to you in everything, Lord. And so I pray that you show us the truth on this. Holy Spirit, come and reveal it to our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. I love you, Lord. Amen. All right, so um, again, <clears throat> this one I just titled Alcohol and the Christian. And um, just kind of, I guess, working through this idea. Um I wrote here that I wanted to preface this article with two caveats. Uh, one, I am coming at this from a biased position. And and so what I mean by that is that I, I, I had made up my mind on this topic already by the time I started writing this article. And, and so I desire uh, it to be wrong to drink. I want it to be wrong to drink. I see that in my heart as, a, as an issue, as a sin. And so I come into this article... Um, looking for alcohol to be a sin. And and because, in my opinion, it, it appears to me to be a sinful behavior. And and in, in, as such, it, it's an offense to God, in, in my opinion. And um, uh, more so, I, I think it's an, it's an occasion for the Gentile world to blasphemy us. If they see a brother or sister drinking, it, it gives them occasion um, to say, oh, you're a Christian and you drink. Um, but again, there, there's... A, as I've matured in these last two years and here just recently, as I'm thinking this over, there's things in my life that people could say that about too. So uh, I'm trying to be open-minded and open-hearted on this, but um, because I have this preconceived idea, this bias, um, it does make it really hard um, for me to see this issue clearly, um, to, to see if I'm wrong on it. There, there's, there, you know, when, when we're convinced of something, you know, there, there's almost a blindness that comes upon us. So um, while trying to study this out from a neutral standpoint, I recognize um, I, that bias in me. I recognize that I am trying to make the scriptures uh, prove my point. And that's dangerous. Uh, when one has a preconceived opinion, um, it becomes very hard to rightfully divide the word and to not interject our own position and to twist the scriptures um, to fit our own position. Um, so with that said, I need everybody, um, to listen to this very carefully, listen to my conclusions very carefully, um, to see if I am discerning the scriptures correctly, um, or if I'm twisting them, um, to favor my position. It, you know, if I'm not seeing this clearly, if I'm wrong on this and, um, recent habits in my own heart and in my own life are causing me to see this in a different light almost, uh, there's, like I said, there's things I do that I feel I have the liberty to do that other Christians and, and non-believers might go, you know, that's sin. And 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 so maybe it's the same with alcohol and, and maybe I'm, I just wasn't seeing it right when I wrote this article. But if I'm not seeing it clearly, um, please, please pray along with me, like my prayer here to begin this, that, that God would grant me repentance, that God would allow me to see this correctly um, and... and, and and two, that that until the Lord reveals uh, the truth to my heart, that I wouldn't judge anybody too harshly or, or um, be too um, censorious towards towards any brothers or sisters who feel that they have the liberty to have a beer or two or have a glass of wine. Um, but the second caveat that I wanted to put on this is that um, I, I'm spiritually undecided on this topic, um, you know, and and. Um, I'm still wavering in my heart on it back and forth, you know, and I, and I freely admit that I very well could be wrong on this. You know, I'm intellectually persuaded and I'm going to show you how through these, I'm going to point out several scriptures 
where I where I think that it shows clearly that a Christian shouldn't drink. So it, so I'm intellectually persuaded based on these scriptures, but I'm not spiritually persuaded. And what I mean by that is that um, logically my conclusions seem to make sense to my thought process. As I work through these scriptures, as I exegete these scriptures, it makes sense to my brain. It makes sense logically. Um, but God has not specifically revealed that truth um, to my inner man. And, and, and the born again understand what I mean by that. When God tells you something, when, when something is revealed through the scriptures, when your eyes are enlightened and you're not just looking at it intellectually, you're not just dissecting the verse and, and looking at it exegetically, but it's becoming a reality. It's becoming wisdom in your heart. It's the Holy Spirit speaking it light into your heart and revealing that truth to you. You know, when God does that, um, that truth becomes absolute. It becomes foundational. Um, and, and it's at that point that we stand in faith upon that truth and we never waver. We never back down. We never surrender. Not only do we see it clearly in the scripture, but the author of the scriptures has, has spoken it to our hearts. And, and so once God has revealed a truth to your heart like that, I think it's, you know, it's, it, it's impossible to be persuaded of any, any other viewpoint. Um, for God is true and every man a liar. Uh, Romans 3, 4 says that. Uh, it says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Um, but when, when we're merely intellectually persuaded on an issue, and not spiritually enlightened on a topic, um, there is a chance for error. You know, n no matter how reasonable or logical or intellectual, we could be wrong. You know, our minds and our thought processes are fallible. You know, we make mistakes, we make errors, we have preconceived ideas, we have desires and motives that mess things up. Um, you know, the heart is deceitful above all things. And, and so, uh, you know, unlike God, we deceive ourselves and we make mistakes. You know, and so while I am intellectually con intellectually convinced on, on my point of view here, um, and again, I say it somewhat, you know, I, I certainly can see the other point of view. I understand where people are coming from when they make their arguments. Um, I, I've, I haven't had this specifically spiritually revealed to my heart as a truth. It's, it's, not, it's not an absolute for me. It's not a hill that I'm going to stand and die on. It's a position I'm going to take. And, and I'm going gonna, gonna to argue for it based on the scriptures here, but it's not something where, like I said, I would divide um, and consider a brother in grievous sin or in a heretical position who, ta who takes the opposite position and says, you know, I'm allowed to have a drink every now and then. Um, so with all that said, I, I want to look at several verses on this topic. And keep in mind um, that one of the things I do when I'm looking at a verse here, um, my first thought is, what kind of writing is this? Or maybe not my first thought, but but it has to be considered. Um, and what I mean by that is, is it is is this writing a historical narrative um, in which we're simply being informed of something that occurred in history? In, in other words, is it just a, um, a a dictation of events like the Book of Acts? The book of Acts takes us through history. It's a, it's a history book. It tells us what occurred. Um, or is it is it a teaching manual? Is it doctrine? Um, is it instruction for living in a, a righteous life, uh, which is what most of Paul's letters are, if not all of his letters. They're instructions to the church on how to be a Christian, how to live a Christian life. So it's a different type of writing than a historical narrative. Uh, the Gospels and the book of Acts would be history. It, it's a narrative informing us what occurred, saying here's what occurred in history. Paul is saying it uh, is a teaching manual, an instruction book, saying here's what you must do. And so we have to consider that when we're reading a scripture. What kind of writing is this? Um, and, and unfortunately, I think people often confuse these two. You know, they can read a historical narrative and then um, 
derive a teaching from it, pull pull some sort of doctrine out of, out of a historical narrative. Now that can work. Um, that that's not to say that God doesn't do that. God does reveal um, these general moral principles. Um, throughout uh, the Gospels, throughout the book of Acts, throughout all the historical books of the Bible, we see the character of God. We see how God works with men. We see what God expects. We see the judgment of God. And from that, we can derive uh, principles um, on, on which to base our lives. Um, but, it, but that's not necessarily wise in all issues. You know, you can't read about how, how Jesus told Peter to get out of the boat and walk across the water and say, therefore, Christians can all walk on water. You, you, you can't pull doctrine out of, that, out of that historical narrative. You can't say, you know, it, what, that, what that scripture is telling us is this is what occurred. Jesus commanded Peter to get out of the boat and to walk on the water, and that's what happened. That's not a doctrine. That's not saying, you know, you do this. Um, whereas uh, Paul would say, you know, flee fornication. That's a command. That is a doctrine. That's not historical narrative. That's him teaching us. So there's a distinction between the two writing styles. Um, when you confuse the two, um, it would be like reading a history book on America. Um, and, and you come to the part where it says that um, our, a lot of our forefathers owned slaves. And, and so then you take that and you conclude, see, it's, it's okay for us to have slaves. That, that's, not, that's foolish. That's nonsensical. You can't read history and derive teaching from it. Um, historical narrative does not equate to doctrinal teaching. Um, instead, like on the issue of slavery, we would look to, to clear teachings on the issue, uh, like the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which clearly forbids slavery. Um, so on the one hand, you have history. On the other hand, you have teaching. You have law. Um, and that's how it is with the scriptures. Sometimes we read of something that occurred in history, and then we erroneously conclude that this is a teaching that we should abide by. Um, and, and that can sometimes lead us in the wrong direction, um, especially if we have direct teaching uh, that verses that prove otherwise. Case in point would be like Acts 2.38, which uh, some churches really emphasize um, when, when at the Pentecost, um, you know, uh, people believed and then they spoke in tongues. That's a historical narrative that's telling us what occurred in history. It's telling us what happened at that point in time. That's not teaching us. But a lot of churches will then teach, see, if you are baptized in the Spirit, you must speak in tongues. They derive a teaching out of that historical narrative and they twist things. Whereas we have direct teaching in 1 Corinthians 14 that tells us tongues is not meant to be done in the church uh, because it causes confusion and it causes the lost people to come in and say these people are nuts. They're bar barbarians. Um, so you have, you have the historical narrative versus the direct teaching. Um, so before scrutinizing each verse, um, you know, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at it and say, is this a teaching verse or is this a historical narrative verse um, that we may be able to derive a moral teaching from, um, or is it just an eyewitness account uh, of something that occurred in history? Um, so with that said, I'm, I'm going to go through several, several verses here <clears throat> that I think prove my point about alcohol. Um, somewhat. Again, like I said, I, I'm not fully persuaded on this issue. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 6 through 8. It says, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, <clears throat> and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate, breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, helmet, the hope of salvation. So I don't think these verses right here are, are actually talking about alcohol consumption when it says be sober. Um, I think that's talking about being serious minded, being sober minded, which is, you know, just calm, collected, temperate, controlled. Um, but it uses the analogy of alcohol um, because because drunkenness leads to the opposite of that type of behavior. Uh, drunkenness leads to uninhibited behavior, uh, which violates our command to be sober and temperate. 
um, if you're drunk, you can't be cool, calm, collected, and, 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 and um, temperate. But that would be drunkenness. Um, not necessarily drinking alcohol in general, like having a, a beer or two or a glass of wine. It, it's talking about drunkenness. And, and since the opposing argument in, in favor of alcohol consumption uh, is usually, you know, they would point out, well, drunkenness is the sin, not consumption of alcohol in general. You know, a person who, who says that they have the freedom to have a beer or have a glass of wine will point that out. They'll say, look, I'm not getting drunk. Drunk is the sin. Um, having a beer is not the sin. Um, so it, based on that, we have to conclude um, that this particular, these verses here um, do not offer persuasive information one way or the other. Um, we can't conclusively determine uh, whether or not a drink or two is a sin based off uh, the verses about being sober-minded, uh, which would include uh, like 1 Peter 1.13, uh, 1 Peter 4.7, and 1 Peter 5.8, which all talk about being sober-minded or talk about this sobriety. Um, so let's look at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 2 through 3, and then again at verse 8. It says, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, not covetous. And then picking up in verse 8, likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. So here we have a clear teaching uh, that, and again, it's teaching, not narrative. This is a teaching doctrine. We have clear teaching here that deacons and bishops must be sober and not given to wine. Now, two arguments can be made here. Uh, one, um, somebody would argue, well, this is just for deacons and bishops. This isn't for general Christian populace. This isn't for uh, just general saints. This is for bishops and deacons. And then the second argument that they would say is uh, given to much wine means drunk, not just a beer or two or a glass of wine, not general consumption. So against that first argument uh, that this is just for deacons and bishops, I would counter that, um, that this is indeed directed towards deca deacons and bishops, but why? Why is this instructed to deacons and bishops? What is the purpose of these commands? Um, is it not for righteous living? It, it, isn't that the purpose of this? Isn't the, aren't these instructions to instruct bishops and deacons on how to live righteously, to live above reproach, to live holy lives? And, and, and so based on that, why would these not apply to all the saints? We are all commanded to be holy and righteous. If these are the standards of righteousness for the leaders in the church, um, and their qualifications to be a leader, they must have attained these things in order to be a leader in the church. But that means that we should be striving for these things too, because these are standards of holiness, and we're all commanded to be holy. Uh, deacons and bishops firstly, but also every saint. So if these are steps towards righteousness, they are steps that we all must take if we all truly desire to live in holiness. Um, to the second point, um, where somebody would say given to much wine means drunk, um, and this is really a key, key point for me, is I would ask, what is drunkenness? How do you define drunk? Um, the word simply means to be intoxicated. Um, so with such a loose definition, there, there's no really scientific formula to pinpoint at which point the brain becomes intoxicated. You know, cops will give a breathalyzer and say 0.08 on the breathalyzer is above the alcohol limit. You're drunk at that point. But that's a human standard. What is God's standard for drunk? We don't have a, a 0.08 mentioned in the Bible. We just have the word drunk. At which point does a person become drunk? Um, how do we determine when that is? At what point of drinking do you become drunk? You know, and, and, and people can argue all they want, but we simply don't have a definition of that. How many drinks are permissible uh, before drunkenness takes place? 
you know, one shot uh, uh, of whiskey, one shot uh, of bourbon, one shot of vodka can cause lightheadedness. Is that drunkenness? Are you at that point intoxicated? If you're, if you're, if you're feeling lightheaded, something has occurred in you. Um, when a person's buzzed, when they get that body buzz going, is that considered drunk? Um, you know, a beer contains four to six percent alcohol. Is that enough to cause drunkenness? One beer, um, it can certainly cause your body to feel different, cause your brain to feel different. Is that drunkenness? Um, just because the modern world ha has defined drunk as inebriated or 0.08, um, that doesn't mean that that's what actual drunkenness is from a biblical standpoint. It's an undefined term. And, and so I would say that it's not wise to draw too close to it without knowing exactly what it is or when it occurs. We don't know biblically when drunkenness occurs. We don't know how much alcohol consumption um, is considered drunk biblically. There is no scripture that says you can have um, four ounces of alcohol at 6% at alcohol. You know, there is no verse like that. So we don't really know what the biblical definition of drunk is. And, and so I would say, how, how wise is it to walk towards a cliff blindfolded? You know, if, if, if you're standing on the straight and narrow path and, and, and you know drunkenness is to the right of you, you know it's somewhere over there, you don't know where, and it's dark over there, you can't see, how wise is it to take one step that direction? You don't know. It's not wise to, to move that way at all. If we know danger is that way, don't go towards danger. Um, considering that temperance and, and sober-mindedness are the goals of Christian life, we have direct commands on these things, anything that inhibits that uh, would most likely be considered drunk. Any, any, any um, alteration to your, to your sober-mindedness, any in, in inhibiting of your temperance or self-control, um, the uninhibited behavior um, that is exhibited in those who have only had mild alcohol consumption, we've all seen it with our own two eyes. We've all lived that past life. We've all, we've all seen what the the behavior that can that can come from just mild alcohol consumption. So it would seem to indicate that drunkenness occurs much earlier than what we have recently defined in society as drunk. Um, it, there's there's an uninhibited behavior in just mild alcohol consumption, and that is counter um, it, it productive. That it, that that goes against temperance. If you've left the path of temperance, I would argue that you're drunk, and and so I would suggest that drunkenness is not inebriation. It's not it's not you know falling down, acting stupid. It's simply a lack of temperance. If one drink causes you to lose a semblance of temperance, then, then one drink is drunkenness. One modern alcoholic drink could lead to that. And um, uh, for further reference, you can look at uh, Titus 1.7, uh, which says, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. And uh, Titus 2, uh, 2 through 6, which says that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God uh, be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. And uh, <clears throat> there's similar instructions in Galatians 5.21, which I think I read later on in this article here, but um, which uh, Galatians is explaining that drunkenness is a work of the flesh. All right, so the next scripture I want to look at here is Leviticus 10, verse 9. It says, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, 
thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. So we find here a similar teaching for the priesthood in, in the Old Testament. This was a command for the priests. Um, it's very similar to what we find for the bishops and deacons in, in the previously discussed Timothy verses. Um, but these verses instruct us even further. They go a step further than not saying uh, not given to wine, um, like it says in Timothy, in that not only does it say drunkenness is forbidden, but it says that even drinking wine or strong drink is disallowed. Um, so again, we must ask why. Um, why is this a command? Is it not for holiness's sake? Um, they were going to enter the tabernacle. They were going to go into the holy of holies. Um, they, to disobey would be a sentence of death. So the implication being that not only was drinking wine a sin, it was a sin worthy of death. It, it, it made a, a priest impure. It tainted them and prevented them from going into the Holy of Holies. So, and if this type of holiness was required of the priests, then again, we have to ask ourselves, why not us? Um, isn't holiness the goal? Isn't that the goal of all saints? Are we not to be striving for righteousness? Are we not to give justification for the flesh? And again, I, I, I know I have some hypocrisy in my life. There's things I struggle with, but that's not justification. You know, we have to fight against sin everywhere we find it in our lives. Um, and we have to be each other's keepers and, and point out sin in each other's lives and, and strive towards holiness. Um, shouldn't we all be desiring that as Christians? Is that not the heart of a Christian to be holy, to be righteous? And, and, you know, we must all seek to go as high up this mountain as possible, you know, as grace will allow us. You know, we have to keep striving for more and more holiness in our lives. That's what sanctification is. We're, we're pursuing righteousness. We're pursuing holiness. And so if we find a command um, where the priest class was told, um, this is the level of holiness you have to attain, um, don't drink, you know then that should be a holiness that we should be striving for as well. You know, I, I've heard it said, and, and it's a true sentiment, um, and I mentioned it earlier, I think, when I was praying or right before my prayer, um, Christianity um, should not be an attempt to find legal loopholes uh, whereby we can participate in the pleasures of the flesh. We're not looking for outs where, you know, uh, God hasn't forbid this or, or God, you know, didn't say anything about this so I can do this or to find some sort of justification in the scriptures where we can do certain things to please our flesh. That's not what Christianity is about. Um, each of us should be pursuing holiness. That's what Christianity is about. We should each be pursuing righteousness. We should be desiring those things and, and fighting against the failures in our lives. Um, again, I'm not, I, I, I'm not condemning those that, that drink. I'm, I'm not doing that at all. I have my own personal struggles and sins. Um, I'm simply pointing out what I see in the scriptures and saying, let's all strive together for holiness. Let's strive for righteousness. Let's not justify um, the things we do. Let's not please our flesh. Let's fight against that stuff. Let's put it to death. Let's, you know, it, let's hate our sin. Let's fight against it. Let's not ignore it and, and not call it out for what it is. Um, you know, and if you disagree with that, if, if you're if you're still trying to justify your behaviors, and again, I'm not judging. I, I have my own things I'm dealing with. But examine your heart. You know, test to see what your motive is. Um, are you looking for a way to please the flesh? Do you desire this particular thing, this particular um, sin? Do, do you desire it? And so you're trying to um, ignore or work around it, you know, trying to find a way to partake in it without damaging your conscience. And we all do that. I know I, I have blind spots in my own life that need to be pointed out. But but um, so, so again, I, I hope you don't hear this as judgment. It's encouragement. Um, to please, you know, examine these scriptures, see if the things I'm saying are true. And if I'm too harsh, if I'm too censorious, if I'm wrong on this, um, may God reveal that to me. May, may a wise brother or sister come and point it out to me. And in the meantime, I will try my hardest not to not to judge you too harshly or condemn you. Um, if, if I see a brother or sister drinking a beer, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm 
going to have to say something. I'm going to say, you know, brother, you know, is this really a wise thing to do? Is this something you should do? And, you know, the brother or sisters would say, you know, well, I'm not getting drunk. It's not, you know, drunkenness of the sin. I, I just like to have a beer every now and then. I, again, you know, is this beneficial? Is it wise? And and I know I have those things in my own life that, that need to be fought against too. But um, just examine your own heart and study the scriptures. Uh, Proverbs 23 uh, verses 20 through 21 says, Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. So there's no specific instruction here um, regarding personal alcohol consumption, uh, but we are warned here to stay away um, from those that, that are given to wine, from those that are drunkards, to avoid them. Why would that be? You know, it's it's because uh, darkness is it, light is to have nothing to do with darkness. We're to come out and be separate. Now we're going to get to the crux of my argument here. Um, this is really this these verses here are what intellectually persuade me, and and so um, the, this is the the main heart of what what I'm arguing for here. Uh, Proverbs twenty three uh, verses twenty nine through thirty one says, "Who hath woe?" Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. So in my personal opinion, uh, these are the most convincing verses um, that we have on this particular issue. And again, this, this is why I say I'm intellectually persuaded. I think I can see clearly here in this scripture um, that we shouldn't be drinking. Um, I, I believe that these verses are speaking of fermentation. Um, when it says that uh, when it's red, when it gives its color in the cup, when it moves itself aright. That's talking about the bubbling of fermentation. When fermentation occurs and the, and, and the wine starts to bubble, starts to produce alcohol, it starts to move itself with the bubbles. You don't have to stir it. You don't have to, you know, it moves itself aright. Um, so I believe those verses are talking specifically about fermentation. And if that's the case, if I'm correct on that, um, then, then what that implies is that there is a wine that is unfermented wine, uh, an unfermented fruit drink, uh, specifically grape, because wine is made from grapes. So when when it talks when when we have positive verses about wine, when it talks about you know when the scriptures talk about the joy of wine, or or um, you know it, or or when Timothy is instructed to give wine, maybe that, that I'll get to that later, but. We, we do have positive verses about wine. I would argue that it's talking about unfermented wine. It's talking about grape juice. Because once it's fermented, once it's moving itself, once it's alcoholic, we're not even supposed to look at it. The scriptures tell us to not even look upon it, let alone drink it. Um, so therefore, and the scriptures don't contradict each other. So when we have these scriptures about good wine, and it must be talking about unfermented wine because the, the scriptures specifically tell us to not even look at wine when it's fermented, if that's what's meant uh, by moving itself aright. Um, and there's also a beautiful spiritual analogy here uh, between the fruit of the spirit and, and the fermented fruit of false teaching. You know, those that are wrapped up in false teaching, and, and if you've ever encountered these people that are in like Gnostic cults or, or um, in these uh, heavy into these prosperity TV evangelist mo uh, movements, um, they appear to have a spiritual drunkenness about them. I think they even use the term uh, drunk in the spirit. Um, and it's like they're, they're, they've been intoxicated by the poisonous fruit, by the fermented fruit of Gnosticism, um, they, they they've been um, in, you know they they they've been uh, intoxicated. That's the word. And and when you encounter them, that's what it seems like. There seems to be this 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 air about them of intoxication. I remember a conversation I had one time with a Freemason, 
and and just you know he he looked drunk in his eyes there was just a spiritual drunkenness about him uh but it's another topic for another time um in, in this particular case um, I think we are specifically warned in these proverb uh, verses here to avoid fermented fruit juice, wine. I think the word wine just means fruit juice, grape juice. And so we have unfermented uh, wine, uh, juice, and we have fermented wine, alcohol. And we're told to not even look upon the fermented juice. Why? Because it leads to sorrow, it leads to woe, it leads to contentions, it leads to babblings, it leads to wounds. And, and common sense and experience, you know, we've all been around drunks. We've all been drunk ourselves probably. Um, it, it, we've, all, we've all seen this with our own eyes. It, it proves the point. We've seen that those that drink wine, that drink alcohol, end up babbling, end up falling down and hurting themselves, end up uh, with contentions and fights. Um, these are the very qualities that we see in those who drink. Uh, the parties or bars that we once attended in our former lives, uh, did they not come with woe? Did they not come with sorrow and fights, loud and obnoxious speech and, and injury? Um, if nothing else, these verses from Proverbs, um, these alone should persuade Christians uh, that they shouldn't even look at alcoholic drinks. Side note here, um, just something to ponder on when you're driving by an alcohol store, why is it that it's referred to as spirits? Wine and spirits, it always says on it. Um, there, there's something to that. All right, Matthew 11, uh, verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Uh, this story is also mentioned in Luke uh, 7, verse 34, I believe. So, this appears to be uh, a problematic verse um, for my position, and one that somebody in opposition to what I'm saying might bring up. Um, because at, at face value, it seems to imply that Jesus drank wine. You know, and if that's the case, it cannot be a sin to do so. Because Jesus never sinned. He's the sinless Savior. However, I would have a few counter arguments, uh, counterpoints to this argument. One, um, again, this is a historical narrative. This is simply telling us what occurred. It's not a direct teaching. We, we can't draw doctrine out of this. We can't look at this historical account and say, see, it's okay for Christians to drink. It's simply telling us what occurred. It's not instructing us on how to live. In other words, um, even if um, this was showing that Jesus drank wine, which I don't think it does, um, it does not permit us in the light of scriptures uh, um, to, to drink alcohol. It, it, it's not given us authorization. All right, my second point here, my second counter, counter argument is that it says that he came eating and drinking. It does not specifically say that he came drinking alcohol. Um, we certainly can't infer that alcohol is meant here. You can't just put that in there because you want it to be there. Um, you can't just infer that into the into the into the verse. Um, and so beyond that, uh, again, we certainly can't build doctrine off of that inference. You can't infer that it's saying Jesus drank wine and then build a doctrine saying, "See, it's okay for Christians to drink wine." Um, now, somebody might argue and say, well, if he was just drinking grape juice or, or drinking water, then why did they call him a wine-bibber? Now, again, we're inferring into this historical narrative. We're interjecting our own opinions into this, and it would not be wise uh, to build a doctrine or a behavior off of this narrative. The fact that Jesus was often ministering to drunkards, uh, revilers, and whoremongers could certainly lead to being unjustly accused of participating in their behaviors. You know, if your enemies, um, like let's say you had a ministry where I know a guy, I heard of a guy, I don't know a guy, who used to go and minister at a gay bar. Um, he would go sit at the bar and drink a 7-Up or a Sprite, and he would minister to the, to, the, to the gay attendees there. But imagine if your enemies saw you coming out of that bar often. Um, they would certainly label you as a drunk. 
or, or a homosexual, um, even without knowing what your intentions of, of for being there. So the fact that Jesus was often ministering to drunks, was often ministering to whores, was often ministering to to to, to people in these situations, um, could could certainly lead to his enemies accusing him of these things, which makes sense here. They're they're calling him out. They're saying, you know, look at him. He's a glutton and a wine bibber. You know, a friend of publicans and sinners. Um, so I'm left to say that this is a historical narrative. Um, and it's inconclusive, and it certainly cannot be used to justify drinking. We do not know what Jesus was drinking, and and we don't know um, if his accusers were accurate in their accusations. And, and I, for one, uh, believe that Jesus did not drink alcohol in light of the scripture from Proverb twenty three thirty one. If the scriptures tell us um, that we're not supposed to look on wine when it's fermented, then Jesus would not violate his own command. Uh, but, you know, again, this verse here, it, it, it's inconclusive. We, we can't prove a point one way or another. So what we have to do is we have to rely on other and clearer scriptures, um, like the Proverbs 23, I believe. Um, 1 Timothy 5, uh, verse 23, I mentioned this earlier here, and it, it's good to take a look at it. Uh, it says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So again, um, wine here could certainly refer to unfermented juice, you know, the grape juice, um, especially when you consider that verse from Proverbs 23, 31. But even if it didn't, if this is referring to alcoholic wine, um, this does not present um, uh, an opportunity or, or a permission or an allowance uh, to drink simply for drinking's sake. The rationale for allowing um, the drinking of wine here is the fact that Timothy suffers from s some sort of health issue. Um, so the wine is used for medicinal purposes. It's not for leisure or pleasure. It's a medicine. Uh, Paul is instructing Timothy to use wine as a medicine. And so in that case, you know, I, I would certainly have no issue uh, with somebody drinking wine. If a, if a doctor or a health professional advises you um, that a glass of wine is needed uh, for medicinal purposes, and there are benefits to, to red wine, it, there's, there's good benefits for heart, for blood, um, for stomach, I guess, here. So if your doctor prescribes you a glass of wine every night, um, then by all means, you know, drink that glass of wine. I, I wouldn't have an issue with that. I wouldn't have an argument with that. It's, it's the same principle as, as taking something like Tylenol PM um, or um, Robitussin. You know, if it's needed for a medical reason, then, then use it. Uh, but, and, and this is where you would have to carefully examine your own heart, if you're using it for pleasure, um, if you, then you're abusing it and you're stepping into the world of pharmakia, uh, which is witchcraft. You're using it to alter uh, your mind, to alter your mood. You're using it for, for uh, not for medicinal purposes. You're now using it for pleasure. So, you know, I wouldn't have a qualm against somebody who is advised by their physician to have a glass of wine. Um, however, I would use extreme caution. You know, if doing so violates your conscience or, or causes you to become intoxicated or inebriated, um, it may not be wise or lawful uh, to do so. So I, I guess that would be an area where uh, I'm not sure, you know, you'd, you'd have to wrestle that out in your own heart and, and diligently seek the Lord in prayer. Uh, it's the same principle as to whether or not, you know, it would be okay to use morphine when you're in pain in the hospital or laughing gas. I remember um, I wrestled with that a lot when I went to get my wisdom teeth pulled out. Um, I was really super nervous about them giving me the, the laughing gas at the dentist. I was, I was, I was scared I, because of my past drug use and, and knowing the world of pharmacia and knowing the demonic world. 
um, that drugs takes you into. I was scared. I was worried. I was, I, I was wrestling. Is this okay for me to do? How do I get these wisdom teeth pulled out without it, without a pain reliever? What do I do? You know, I was wrestling that out in my heart. Um, so I understand that a person would have to wrestle that out in their heart. Um, and it, it's a difficult situation, you know, and I, 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 am not sure where I stand one way or another. I know our Lord is gracious and, um, uh, again, I, 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 I would lean towards if it's prescribed for medicinal purposes and you're using it for those purposes. Um, your motive is simply for the medicinal purpose. It's not for pleasure or to please your flesh. You know, I, I would lean towards it being okay. But um, in any case, uh, this Timothy verse here certainly does not offer a permission um, for recreational consumption of alcohol, just to have a beer because you want a beer. That's not what is being taught here in this First Timothy verse. Um, John verse, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine... The mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, uh, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Now, I don't think that we have any reason to assume um, that this is talking about the fermented alcoholic wine, um, especially in light of Proverbs 23, 31. But, again, even if we did, this is a historical narrative. It's not a teaching. Um, these verses are telling us what happened in history. It's not expressly teaching us that it's okay to drink alcoholic wine. Uh, to infer that, uh, just because of something that was done historically is not wise. Just because something happened does not permit us to partake in the event being described. Um, Jesus at one point uh, entered the temple and flipped tables and, and made a whip to drive people out. Uh, does that mean that we are permitted to enter false churches and to chase people out with a whip? Um, especially in light of verses that command us to be gentle and peaceable and yielding and, and obey to the laws of the land. Um, so, and I think this is the most common scripture that people will bring up when they're trying to justify alcohol consumption. Well, Jesus made wine at the wedding. A, um, I think Proverbs 23 teaches us that there's two different kinds of wine. There's unfermented wine and there's fermented wine. This is, there nowhere in here does this tell us what kind of wine it is. So you can't just infer that into the verse. And, and two, this is not permitting us to drink wine. It's simply telling us what occurred. Um, uh, I'm going to look at several verses here together now. Um, Ephesians 5.18 And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Galatians 5.21, which I mentioned earlier uh, as being works of the flesh. It says, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever is deceived thereby 
is not wise. Isaiah 5.11, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. Isaiah 5.22, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink. So again, um, in all these verses, who determines when drunk occurs? Um, woes are pronounced upon it, and it disqualifies from the kingdom of God. It's a work of the flesh, and it shows a lack of wisdom. With all these severe warnings against drunkenness, and with us being so unsure and uncertain and unknowledgeable as to when drunkenness occurs, isn't it prudent, wise, and necessary to avoid the cause of drunkenness, alcohol, um, altogether? You know, again, it's about being on that path. We have all these severe warnings. We're walking this path of righteousness, and there's warnings, you know, over here is drunkenness, and it's a woe. It's damnation. It's, it's contention. It's babblings. It's death. You know, why take a step in that direction? Why even move in that direction? Stay away from it. Um, a person can certainly continue to argue that consumption of a drink or two is permissible uh, because drunkenness is the sin and not general consumption. But again, where is the wisdom in that? And, and what about the command to not even look at it? You know, that person must carefully examine their own heart and discover why. Why is it that you're desiring to drink an alcoholic beverage? In, in all sincerity, with your, own, with your own heart, is it not for the feeling that it produces? Some people argue, oh, I like the taste of it. Uh, juice tastes better. You know, every, you know Kool-Aid tastes better. You know, the, if you're doing it for the taste, there's better options out there. But be sincere and honest with yourself. Is that really why you're doing it? Or is it for the feeling that it produces? And, and how can you be assured um, that that feeling is not what is meant by drunk? Um, for, you know, and again, for those who argue that they like the taste, I would just say, is that really sincere? Um, sobriety is such a major issue throughout the scriptures. Temperance and self-control are necessary fruits of the Spirit. So why persist in such a dangerous pursuit uh, when it's so unclear uh, on when you pass from pleasure to sin? And, and I'm feeling, you know, uh, convicted in my own heart about some of the things I do. You know, do I do these things for pleasure? Um, or, or, you know, is, is there legit freedom in it? Um, I guess, it, you know, it's just wiser to avoid these things. Um, if you're not persuaded by all these scriptures, I'll leave you with one more. Um, and it's from that Romans 14 that I started with. Romans 14, 21. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. So this issue obviously causes a stumbling block for many brethren. A lot of brothers will see it as a sin. Uh, you know, and it's a horrible witness to the lost world. They see it as sin. You know, and the heathens consider it sinful. So as such, to publicly display this behavior is a sin. You're causing your brothers and sisters to stumble and, and you're giving a bad witness to the lost world. That's unloving, it's unkind, and it's improper uh, for a Christian to drink or discuss drinking alcohol um, in a positive way, in a public atmosphere. If you're truly born again and you have not been persuaded through these scriptures here or, or your own personal struggles or, or wrestlings with the Spirit, working this out in your own heart, if you're not persuaded that drinking alcohol is wrong, and you continue to insist on, on participating in alcohol consumption, um, then I would say that you have to keep that private, you know, based on Romans 14. You know, you shouldn't ever do it in public because you know it's a stumbling block to some and you know it's a bad witness to some. You know, if you're truly born again and this really is a sin, if, if I'm right in the way that I'm reading Proverbs 23, 
um, then, you know, the Lord will eventually convict you. And, and that's where my hope is from Romans 14. You serve your own master. You wrestle this out in your own heart and your own conscience. And, and like I said, you know, I, I'm, for one, I'm, I'm not going to judge you. Um, you know, if you're not inebriated, if you're not partaking in drunkenness and you have a beer or two or a glass of wine, I'm not going to condemn you and consider you an unbeliever. Um, I, I might say something, I might caution you, I, I don't know, but, but if you're not persuaded that this is a sin, you know, for the sake of your brethren and for the glory of the Lord, um, in the lost world, uh, I would just caution that you keep this behavior to yourself. Um, and, and I would issue a stern caution and not just for you, for my own, I'm, I'm, I'm stumbling through this last section here because I'm thinking about the own, the my own personal things that I do, um, that could be considered sin, that that the lost world might look upon as sin, um, or that may be a stumbling block block to brothers. And I'm thinking, man, I'm saying these things, and what a hypocrite I am in my own heart. You know, I'm doing these other sins, but, um. What we do know is that drunkenness has severe, serious, and dire warnings. You know, so please be very careful and cautious to not fall into that sin. Even if you have the liberty from the Lord to have a drink or two, be very cautious. You don't know where that line of drunkenness is. Be very, very careful um, to not fall into that sin. All right, so um, I, I, I hope... Um, I was kind of balanced in this article and, and that um, I haven't offended anybody and at least maybe given some people some things to think about. Um, I, I know I'm still wrestling this out in my heart and even as I'm even right now, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm thinking about my own personal things that I do that somebody might look down upon. So let us all wrestle together towards holiness. Let us let us edify one another and, and pursue holiness together. And, um, you know, just wrestle this out in your heart. Bring it to the Lord in prayer. And, and, and um, I hope this article was beneficial at least. But, all right, uh, if, you, if you're catching just the end of it and you weren't able to watch the whole thing, um, I'll get it posted on my YouTube here right away, Lord willing. Um, it's King Ram 417. That's K, my middle initial, Ingram, my last name, 417. And uh, till next time, I love you guys. Talk to you later.